Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you very, very much for being here. And um, uh, I've tried in the arrangement of the chairs to make, um, oh, we've got a bit of an echo going. Great. Keep going? Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, to make this a, 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 a f as friendly as possible a gathering so that we can have lots of nice discussion. Um, we're going to uh, split our discussion into three parts. Um, and in each section, I'm going to um, ask you to come in with your questions and points and observations. So please um, feel free to jump in, because um, uh, that's really what we're here for. We're, we're, we're interested in what you have to say um, as uh, really the next generation of people who are coming up um, and very importantly being exposed to the news and what your understanding of that is, is very important. I'd love you, to, it's very nice and, and brilliant that we have uh, Miss Jafreda here today, um, who is uh, a, an experienced um, journalist. She told me not to say award-winning, but I know you have won an award, um, but, um, and works for a newspaper called The Guardian, which is, uh, has become one of the, um, the world's uh, main international newspapers. It's, it's actually got a reach, um, you know, starting in the UK, actually in Manchester originally, um, but now um, has obviously an office here in Italy, as well as in the US um, and many other countries around the world. Um, so, without further ado, um, should we take a seat? Yeah. And um, the first thing uh, we're going to talk about is um, the shape of the media and journalism today. Um, really looking at the, the spectrum of different sources of uh, news that are out there. And I'd love you to be thinking about where you get your news from as we're speaking. Um, and please be honest about that, because it's really fascinating um, to hear um, your usage and, and how you interface with this big topic of the truth, because of course that's what we hope we're getting uh, when we read the news, and professionals like Ms. Jafreda um, are working very hard to ensure that it is the truth that we consume. Um, but that isn't always the case, and that's something that we'll look at in a minute. Um, so perhaps if I could pass over to you, uh, Angela, for this section where we're gonna talk about the different uh, kinds of news outlets that are out there, and maybe we touching on this idea of left and right uh, within the press. Sure. Um, well, thank you all for, for having me here today. Um, I was feeling quite a mix of nervousness and excitement um, to come and speak to you. So often I, um, I get to come and talk to students, and it reminds me of when I, you know, many years ago now, when, when I started um, thinking about a career in, in journalism. And a lot's changed since then. I mean, we're talking about 20 years now. So I started in local news. Um, and back then, we didn't even have, I mean, we had the internet, but it wasn't being used as a news source. Um, it was, yeah, it was being used by people to, to get information. But in, in those days, the, the news was, was um, newspapers. Um, most, most major newspapers didn't really have a website, I don't think, until maybe the year 2000, around, well, towards the late, mid to late 90s, I think it, it started to, to develop. And even when I, when I was working for my first daily newspaper, which was in the UAE, um, the priority was the newspaper. So we'd have to write like a couple of, you know, when, once the web started to develop, and we're talking about 2008, um, we'd have to kind of get news online quite quickly, um, but the priority was still, still the newspaper. Um, so it, it's, it's developed, it's, it's changing, um, you know, back in the, 90s, there was we, there was the fear that the 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 webs the internet would kill newspapers. Um, it didn't. Um, it led to, um, I suppose, more opportunities and even more opportunities as, um, for journalists. Even though the, the industry is still is still quite tough. Um, and but but what we have are still the the, the 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 major titles around the world that still are still surviving and are still going fairly strong are the ones that started. Gosh, I mean, The Guardian's um, 202 years old now. Um, that started in Manchester in the UK and is now considered a, a global newspaper. We have an office in the US, an office in Australia, and in both those countries, they still produce um, newspaper versions of, of the news adapted to their, their geographical uh, locations. 
Um, so we have The Guardian, which is um, considered, I mean, it started out as a, I think it was, it was um, kind of workers' rights protests that were happening in, in Manchester at the time, and it was seen as um, a voice for the, you know, the underprivileged, the underdog. Um, and it's kind of carried that with it over the last um, 200 or so years. So it's considered um, a progressive, mostly left-wing um, newspaper, although we do try to um, have a balance now. There's more, um, I, I know just from the stories I write um, about Italy, you know, I, I try to include, if it's a political story, um, try to include, be more neutral, try to include both sides, um, right and left, although sometimes you do have to take a stand in, in certain situations. Um, and then we have the Sunday Times, which, again, another British newspaper, um, but owned by Rupert Murdoch, who's Australian, and has, has basically monopolised quite a few of the, the titles over the years in, in both the UK um, and, and the US, and that's considered more... It's more right wing, but not not as right wing as say the Telegraph. There's a bit more of a. I think the the the, the UK Times is probably a, a little bit more centrist. Um, and then obviously, yeah, America is a big. I mean, that's another Fox News is is massive again, owned by Rupert Murdoch. Um, pretty right wing. I would say I can't say I delve into Fox News um, too much, so I haven't really been. Yeah, I mean, but, but their, their headlines will will you know, be drastically different from the Guardian's, um, for example, and it's kind of very much um, I think divided more on, on the kind of left, right wing political argument. Even though the political scene is is quite a grey, you know, in terms of what is what left and right means anymore. <laughs> that's what's that's your also thoughts changing. on that? This, you know, is, is there a shift on what is considered left wing and what's considered right wing Gosh. now? Or what, where is that shifting? Gosh, that's a... Um, that is a difficult question, but I, I think just generally in, in politics, it's, it's hard to, you know, what, what, what do you consider left-wing now? I mean, I, I've just talked from my own personal experience of growing up in the UK, and I came from quite a, um, say, left-wing Italian-Irish family, you know, so um, working class. And... So we, you know, we were kind of like the workers. So Labour, which was a, a left-wing party, is a left-wing party, um, or centre-left nowadays, represented, you know, we're more kind of representative of us, especially you know, we have like an Irish granddad who would be fuming at the TV over Margaret Thatcher, who was the first female um, British Prime Minister and very conservative. Um, so that was, you know, the, the, the lines were quite clearly divided in those days. Now it's, it's you, you have a lot of, people who might have originally voted or considered themselves left-wing who might have actually been pushed to vote for the right in, in, more, in more recent years because they feel that they don't, they, their needs aren't being... They're not represented um, by politics. So I find it I interesting that, a, for example, words like elite, which used to be yeah. very much a right-wing kind of idea, but now is, is, is pushed towards the left as yeah. the, the so-called liberal elite yeah. uh, and, and the kind of... You know, the, the language maybe has has swapped in, in some senses. And the, the idea of populism now. Exactly. Um, which, yeah. when you think of a popular movement, sometimes you're thinking of a labor movement. But actually, no, now that's yeah. more likely to be uh, looking at a, a, yeah. a right wing. Uh, exactly. And just going on from that in terms of you know, how populations vote and how they think, the media plays a huge role in that. And we've probably seen newspapers that have become more, maybe either more aggressively right-wing. Um, in Italy, for example, there's more, probably more right-wing press than there is um, left-wing press. Um, so, so that then does have a big influence. And the owners of those media organizations also have an influence because if they're, if they're especially if they're business people, then they'll, they'll have an interest in, in who wins um, an election. So if at the same time they own a newspaper, like Ber Silvio Berlusconi is the prime example I can think of in, in Italy, who um, is the owner of uh, three times prime minister, but also the owner of a lot of the media here. So obviously he would, he would push, be able to push his agenda. Um, so yeah, I think, I think it kind of, did, both things are very much intertwined. I'm just intrigued by these websites that I'm clicking and I'm probably distracting everybody. 
that you know, the amount of advertising that's on these websites. I mean, now we can't actually see the news because, uh, oh, thank you. <laughs> the gods in the technology of, 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 I was actually looking at the advert. Um, <laughs> uh, but how More interesting than the news. Well, make some, well. <laughs> <laughs> um, guys, I just wanted to ask you, um, how many of you um, read a physical newspaper or, or come across a physical newspaper on, uh, let's say, a weekly basis? Let's not even hope for daily. Okay. Okay, we've got um, about five people, mostly towards the back of the room, and we have some at the front. Okay, fantastic. Okay, six, seven. Okay, so I'm saying that's probably about 2% of the room, 3% maybe. Um, how many of you look at a, uh, a newspaper website on more or less a weekly basis? Okay, so that is more looking like 50% perhaps. Um, thank you very much. And how many of you um, use um, social media for your news? So that could be... Okay, there's a, there's a hardcore group over here that's doing social media. Okay. Okay. Okay, very good. Um, and is anybody going to be brave and say that they're just not interested in the news? They're not going to... Okay. Good. Either you're, you're <laughs> very, very good news readers. Okay. So I think that's interesting, isn't it? Just, just in our, in our uh, rather selective group here of our totally. rather brilliant students. Um, that the, the physical newspaper, probably in some households, is still a, a tradition. It's, it's something that people feel good having around. Um, but I think it looks like there's still there's a, a big shift into, into the online kind of platforms. Is there a particular issue that you think comes with online? I mean, I'm thinking about this obtrusive advertising for a start. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I think it depends on, on the newspaper and the website, I think. Um, I mean, the speed of news is obviously... The speed obviously... of news, gosh, I think, I think sometimes it can tend to feel crowded. And, and you know, especially when you have horrific stories. I, mean, I, I don't know how you feel about this, but um, just everything that's going on in the world today, it's like, it's like you don't have any breathing space between one horrific story and the next. Um, and you're just getting your head around what's happening in one part of the world when something horrific happens in another part of the world. And, you know, there's so much context behind why it's happened as well. Um, and sometimes I think you can go onto a website and it's just, you've got, you know, even The Guardian, I go on and we've just got a live blog going, on Ukraine war, Israel war, and, you know, where do you start? Um, and it's all mostly bad news um, at the moment. So I think I think the danger is some, with the risk. I think with digital journalism, it, you need to be. I think you need to try to make the you know in order to get the people to read the news. And obviously, as journal, we can see now. Um, <laughs> I mean, back in the day before the internet came along, we didn't have the traffic, the, the graphics to show us whether our stories were actually read or not. You know, they just went published, got published in the newspaper, and we hoped we assumed they'd be read by whoever bought them. Um, but now we can actually see how many readers. Um, come to our stories and how long they spend on them, you know, because sometimes it might just be a case of clicking on, like having a look at the headline and the first few words and then clicking out of it. Um, so, you know, we, we also have a responsibility, obviously, to make sure, you know, there's, you know, at, especially when we're in a rush to write a story and it's pro probably a topic that we haven't touched upon or had an experience on, we want to make sure we feel responsible for making sure the information is correct and factually correct. Um, but also, just for readers, I think you know it's important to engage them in a way that that contextualises um, a story um, rather than just giving sensational kind of bold facts. And I think a good website, um, I would obviously cite the Guardian. I mean, the, the, the good thing, the, you know, the good thing about the Guardian compared to some of the others is it's it's free. I mean, it's. it's Mostly free, you know, you can subscribe to it, donate to it. You do get a bit of a, if you've clicked on one too many stories, you do get a message at the end of, you know, trying to guilt you into donating, <laughs> making it's a very donation. very polite. Very polite. I mean, it, it can be guilty. anything from like one euro to whatever. Um, it does make you feel slightly guilty. Um, but it's, I think it's a well-designed website. Um, and you, it's clearly distinguished into regions of the world. And as news has become more global, 
it's, um, it's, it's, yeah, it, I think it's got, got a nice layout. I think there's quite a bit of it. They probably could, you know, cause I'll ask you, you know, you will probably know more about this than I do just in terms of, you know, your generation and what the kind of, like having an interactive, more interactive news. You know, I think you're probably keen to maybe absorb, um, absorb news maybe through videos or, or something that's more interactive rather than huge long blocks of text. Um, and I think we try, you know, we kind of go in a lot more in that, in that direction now. So, I'm just uh, ask the students for their questions. Sebastian. Uh, hello. Uh, one thing that really caught my attention was in the first slide. Could you go back to the first slide, if possible? Like when you first came, it said, um, the idea of truth in a, like, journalism and truth in a post-truth world. I want to know your, did you write the statement? Um, no, I did. Oh, oh okay, <laughs> sorry. Well, I have the question of what was your exigence in coming to this idea, and well, why, why did you write this here? Um, thank you for that. Um, so, actually, we're going to talk about that in our second section. So, c if we can hold my response until then. Did you have a question? No. Any other questions? Yes, Susanna. So my question is mainly centered on how are you as journalists adapting to this like ever-changing way of presenting news like with TikTok and like um, the span of attention that is changing, especially within the newer generations? How are written news adapting to that? Um, that's, a, that's a very good question and one that I think probably scared me more a decade ago um, than it does today in, in terms of how to adapt because I, I came into journalism you know a long 20 years ago and I've always been writing just writing I never had to think about news or might have had to you know occasionally I take photographs um, rarely you know occasionally I've had to like film myself that I will then just send to my editors but I I did that when, when, when the Venice was flooded. We had the, the Aqua Alta in 2019. And it took me about an hour and a half just to get the video right. You know, because I was just reporting from the flood. And that took me longer in a way than it would have done if I'd gone around and got quotes and, and wrote a story. And I sent it to our, it was for our Instagram account. And that's the only time, probably because it, was, it wasn't that great. They've asked me to do it, thankfully. So I think the trick is, if you really don't want to do it, just be bad at it. Um, and then you just like stick to the, uh, stick to the text. Um, yeah, it's a good question. I think, I don't know, what, what I quite, you know, with us, there isn't so much pressure on, you know, what my editors need from me, for example, is the, cop the copy to be, you know, to respond to a story, whether it's breaking news or a feature, and to be able to get the information, speak to people, be on the ground, um, still do what, what you know, the, 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 the core of what journalism is, send my copy without being expected to do anything else. Um, we haven't had, there hasn't been so much of a push from us yet towards TikTok, um, Instagram yet, TikTok, uh, yes, sorry, in Instagram, um, TikTok less so. So, but, but I feel that the, there's probably more pressure on younger journalists coming in now to have a variety of skills in everything. Um, to be able to secure, obviously to secure a role, but, but obviously, you know, to be competitive in, in the market. Um, whereas, you know, at, at the moment, I, I, I see them both kind of working alongside each other without there being sort of too much of a, of a push for everything to be done through social media. I think we had another question over here, Rafi. Uh, yeah, just on this topic of sort of like, I don't know, trying to grab attention in different ways, does this shift to online news, does it sort of prompt journalists more to write sort of snappier headlines that sort of like, yeah, force people to click because a lot of, I don't know, I have a few friends who will complain sort of like, oh, the headlines are always sort of never telling the full truth and letting you, like you forcing you to read the article to get the truth. I don't entirely agree. I mean, I would expect that a sort of a headline from a quality newspaper would have like, would at least summarize its article relatively well, but would you, yeah, how would you comment on that? Do you think that, um, I think that's the case. I think headlines do have to include less of the sort of, story now to get people to click them and yeah that, that's a very good 
um, question. I mean, uh, you know, you, basically, we are skilled. You need to be writing a headline is a really skilled job. And there was a time when I was working for a website when I had to write the headlines for my stories. And I learned quite a lot in terms of what, what made a headline work. You know, a good, snappy, containing some piquant detail from the content of the story. Um, I learned, you know, it made me, you know, it taught me what type of stories work. For, for online, um, and that was that was great training. Um, but what we never did, even in, even in that, you know, for that company, was was you never over uh, over sensationalize. Um, you have you have some websites, I think, or maybe smaller websites, who would probably be depending on those clicks in order to get advertising in, who might um, exaggerate um, a headline, or you have quite severe. Very, um, very aggressive websites, and I will cite the Daily Mail as, as being one of those. Um, <laughs> that would, um, but I think, luckily for the Guardian, I mean, there was a story I did the other day, and Im Im immediately when it went online, I saw that the, the editor just made an error in the headline. And, and the way it made it look like, it was, I, I might as well explain the story, it was about um, Amanda, Knox, Amanda Knox's trial going back to, to, to um, she was accused of murder um, here in Italy, um, 2007, um, acquitted. Um, but now there's one element of that case that is going to be retrialed. But the headline was like, Knox conviction overturned and going back, being sent to retrial. And it well, hasn't been overturned. It's just going, it's being re retrialed. But I was luckily it was just a subbing error. Um, but I think for us journalists, I, I don't have any responsibility over the headlines of my stories. But I'm always very careful to check that the headlines are kind of the tone is right for the story, and, and that they're you know. But again, it all depends on all depends on the website. But you know, I wouldn't be so cynical even as to say that it's all about the headline. You know, at the end of the day, you do need a catchy, clever headline. Um, but at the end of the day, I think most sites are, are kind of, most major newspapers are kind of careful to make sure the story, the facts of the story, you know, are correct and the headline justifies that. I think that's worth pointing out, actually, that, yeah. that the journalist isn't responsible for the headlines and the layout of the page, that there are lots of different people doing different jobs with the text. Um, uh, maybe that's yeah. not always going to be the case, but still that's fairly traditional exactly. in the sense that, you know, the, the journalist is writing the copy of, of the story um, that's sent in, and then a sub-editor is the one who actually puts together the headlines based on that. And that can lead to some errors, like you were saying. Yeah, it does. And then, and then we're obviously, because it's our byline, we, we're the ones who get the grief on things like social media. You know, and it can be over a relatively minor thing. But the, the, the responsibility is basically as soon as ours responsibility. I think I think read, people forget that there's a whole like, host of editors and sub -ed editors involved um, too. So we're just going to move on to our next section, but I'm going to come back to you for your question. Um, so the next thing we were going to talk about um, is, in fact, uh, Sebastian, to answer Sebastian's question. Um, thank you. I, I prepped you beforehand, Sebastian, so that's great. Um, and we were actually going to look at um, a video um, that, do you want to explain the, the context of this? Yeah, so a month ago I was on the southern Italian island of Lampedusa, and it was um, during a week or so when there was a huge increase in the number um, of people arriving, um, immigrants arriving from North Africa by boat, and it caused quite a um, significant humanitarian crisis. Um, it's a tiny island. Um, of about 3,000 people, and I think about, uh, roughly about 8,000 arrived within the space of a few days. You know, and obviously this this issue, immigration in Europe, is a is quite a, uh, a divisive issue. And whenever these stories, I mean, it was very high profile at the time as well in terms of politics. We had the Italian Prime Minister um, come to the island along with the European. Um, Commission President Ursula von der Leyen. And during that time, I mean, there was lots going on. I was there reporting. And this is, this is the confusing thing when you're a journalist on the ground. I mean, the best place to do your job is just to be on the ground, seeing it, experiencing it, interviewing the people involved. Um, and what you've got, you know, outside of that situation is social media. You know, people from the other side of the world giving their comment and sharing things on social media. Um, 
and just kind of making, you know, it makes us, even some websites, you know, journalists who aren't on the ground are writing stuff and they're just kind of repeating whatever they see sometimes on, you know, they're getting their information from, from whatever and it can be quite um, overwhelming during that time. So there was a lot of, lot of stuff being tweeted about, you know, from quite high profile politicians in Europe as well. And a colleague of mine alerted me to some, some well, she was doing a story actually about misinformation. And I saw, when I Google, when I did a hashtag for Lampedusa on Twitter, I came across this video, which, yeah, it said... <laughs> Lo ammazza, 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 lo um, yeah, so she's written, you know, some very vitriolic comments about a situation that wasn't Lampedusa, basically. I mean, you can tell, in, anyone who's been to Lampedusa can see that video and say, no, that's not Lampedusa. And that was not <laughs> what was happening on that island. Um, I showed it to, to someone from there, and she immediately said, no, no, it's not Lampedusa. But the problem with something like this is, I mean, I think the, the person who shared it had quite a big following. And then it gets retweeted. And then you get comments from quite high-profile high politicians. We had this, a, a, one called Nigel Farage in the UK, who was basically responsible for bringing about Brexit, based on content like this, um, that, that, that basically triggered a lot of people into voting um, for something they might not have ordinarily have... have but, I mean, that's, a, that's another topic. But he even then jumped on, not so much this video, um, but the false information that was coming out of a situation that, that was an entirely different. I think that was fascinating when you described, you know, you on the ground, you know, being there in the situation, talking to the people. And then, as you said, somewhere on the other side of the world, the news story is happening because somebody's found an old video from, I think this is a music festival or something that happened, in, you know, two years before. Yeah, yeah. Um, and have, have decided to create some kind of narrative uh, out of it to, to fit an agenda for, for the day. Yeah. Um, that must feel very strange, actually, as a journalist, to, to feel that the news story is sort it of It is. It is, because also, when you're, especially on breaking news, any kind of breaking news story, because not only do you, you have the news wires as well, you know, you know credible news wires like Reuters and AFP, and they, they, you know, they're pumping out their, their snap kind of stories very quickly and those stories then are then bought by clients like the guardian for example and sometimes like you know i'll be on the road and my editor will say oh seen this in reuters and it's just like <laughs> even that gets frustrating <laughs> like okay yeah that's reuters you know trusted a very trusted organization um but you know let me kind of do my job um, and they can do their job but it used to be with social and not so much anymore thank goodness but your editor might see something on twitter and we'll be like, and they'll be in London, and you'll be on the ground, and be like, have you seen this? And you're like, oh, you know, have I missed mm. something? And then you look into it, and then it then you waste about however much time trying to work out whether it's true or false, and the majority of the time, it's, it's false. Can you, you know, unless it's come from a credible source. What Reuters well. is, and, and sorry, yeah, yeah. Reuters is a ma and I'm a major um, news organisation, very old one as well, very credible, and it's, it's it's more like a news it's it's a news wire service. So they will do um, stories that then get bought by newspapers. Um, so let's say it, let's say I, the Guardian, for example, let's say it doesn't have a correspondent in Malawi, but Reuters is, has a presence there. Um, then it more often fills a gap. A newspaper would often buy the the wires copy because it fills a gap where they don't have journalists. Mm -hmm. um, and or if I've got a day off on a Saturday, for example, and the story happens, unless it's breaking news, you know, my I would do it myself. But then my 
you know, it, it's kind of like, oh, well, if the correspondent is not there, it's not available, then we'll, we'll take it from the wires. So it's, you know, very useful, but, yeah. So we had another example, <laughs> which is, um, can we go to the next slide? That's it, okay. So this is, um, Can I click this link, guys? Maybe not. Um, so this was the story that was picked up by The Guardian looking at um, a very recent um, example of this kind of disinformation that we have to look out for. Um, and this one involved, um, I think, a, a film that had been produced um, in Palestine. And uh, can you explain what yeah, I think, I think it was quite, um, you know, when the horrific attacks happened in Israel, I think straight away there was a lot that went online that just wasn't true. Um, videos, content, and The Guardian did, did this, this story just explaining to readers what was true and what was, seemed to be very believable but wasn't what. So I think there was a video of, if, if we, could we play, is there the video in the story actually? I think that they've the used magic the, is happening. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and again, it wasn't... I think it's a screen grabs. Oh, no, oh, that, yeah. it's a little YouTube thing. Yeah, I think it's these two little sections from the film. That's a shot from the actual film yeah. and then this is the, the footage that was used yeah so it's, they took a shot from a film that was made I think it was a documentary short film empty place it was about palestine yeah um done maybe over a year ago and reproduced on tiktok and basically you know as if it was happening there today and was news rather than a film. I think this is the scary thing. I mean, obviously, a lot of you guys are now moving into social media for your, um, for your uh, news and are likely to be looking at videos. Um, and of course, there's something appealing about a video because it seems to be the gold standard of truth, doesn't it? It's, it's as if you're actually watching something happening. Um, but here's a classic example where, you know, that can be, we've seen two actually, haven't we? Um, where the news can be repackaged and re-presented uh, in a very, very misleading uh, way. I, I just want to throw this out to you guys. Obviously, we've looked at these two examples of some of the, the kind of misinformation that's happening uh, with the news. Um, are there any thoughts or comments on this or, or questions that you had about it? Does it make you think about your own use of the of social media, Christina? Okay, so I want to ask, um, what methods do you, as a journalist, use to combat this flood of misinformation that is um, very frequently can um, pour in from different areas? Did you get that? Not the beginning part. Um, how do you? deal with this misinformation? How do you check sources and um, what process do you go through? Gosh, <laughs> I think, gosh, uh, I, I think, it, you know, that the golden rule even, you know, I would say to readers is always make sure the source is credible. Um, and I think you can, you, again, you know, you, you've got journalistic sources that are more credible um, than others. Um, I think, you know, could reel off a few titles. Obviously, The Guardian being number one, but, you know, you've got, you know, sources like The New York Times, you know, the, the Sunday Times, the, you know, well, I'm, yeah, I'm talking about the sources in, 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 you know, the prime sources in lots of countries, not just the big English language um, speaking newspapers. Um, but, but, yeah, how do we... I think... Um, yeah, I mean, I, we always have to, let's say, because as, as obviously as a foreign correspondent, you know, a lot, a lot of my, the stories I write, I'm kind of depending on what the Italian newspapers write as well. And, and sometimes 
you know, unfortunately with the Italian press, it's not that they, you know, a lot of good, a lot of good journalists there, but, but sometimes the, the writing can be just quite difficult to get your head around sometimes. It's like making a point of a story. You, should, you just spend most, a lot of time just trying to understand what the story is meant to be about. Um, and sometimes facts can be quite careless, you know, and, uh, or, you know, simple things that they get wrong, like in even someone's age or, some, or someone's nationality, you know, often. often. Um, so I think it's just a case of no intuition, you know, comes in handy, I think, when, you, when you're just trying to um, decipher fact from fiction. But always, you know, calling, just calling experts, calling sources. Um, I think it's quite... You know, I would never just trust a um, video that goes online unless it's something that, you, you know, you just have to work out where it's come from. You know, and, and you know, if it's come from a, a, a profile that, that's looking dodgy or, you know, or a news site that, that isn't, isn't, hasn't got much credibility, um, then I think you can, you can or, you know, or just something that you see on your Facebook feed, it's... it's uh, but then I'm, I'm remembering that earlier you said that you're, you're looking at how many people are reading your article. Yeah. So there's always that other motivation, you know, that, oh, but this is really interesting and people are going to really like reading this. Um, there must be that temptation to, to you know, do the splash um, piece. Um. I kind of got on over that you over the over years. Okay. <laughs> I you, just you don't care yeah. about the likes. No, no. <laughs> the journalist. The it, yeah, no. Just, just, just kind of. Uh, yeah, you, you just got to. I don't know. Speak, you know, know your sources. Speak to your sources. Know, know what you're writing about. You know, understand the con the country, the context of the story. Um, you know, something that sounds like wow. You know, at the beginning. You know, just double check that that. That your facts. I mean that, but that that, that 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 is also the basic rule of of journalism. You know, whether you're writing for a newspaper online. I think we have a question over here. Yes, thank you for being patient. Uh, do you think that all this like misinformation uh, that's swamped up on the internet? Do you think it could actually be a threat or potentially dangerous to uh, not only your actual journalism but also real life? Most definitely. Um, I was actually talking to a professor of journalism at the University of Rome last week, and um, we, we were talking. Actually, we were talking in the context of the pressure on journalists in Italy from the government. You know, so we've had, for example, it's, it's for this current government, and um, there's been quite a few journalists who have been sued for defamation. Um, but it happens under any government. Um, Italy's quite quite bad, regardless of whether it's a left or right-wing government. But he said the thing that worries him the most isn't so much that, because we've had that all the time. It's it's a misinformation, um, because it does have the it, it's it can be so credible, it can it can be so believed, and it does have the it, the power to influence how people think. It creates a lot of division, a lot of hatred. Like for example, the video we we saw from from Lam producer. Um, and it does push people when it comes to election time. It, it does, and we've seen it in in the in the past, um, whereby elections have been influenced in a way that manipulates people into voting for, you know, a certain government. So I think that is the, the biggest challenge. I think is is misinformation because also you know the the, the, the goal of journalism you know you also have to build trust with your readers. So one of the most important things for the survival of journalism is to build trust with readers. Um, so news organisations do have that challenge to make sure what we're what we're giving to readers is is trustworthy and factual. But then you have the challenge of misinformation and which is also very powerful. Thank you, that's a good question. Uh, Leon. Do you think that um, artificial intelligence is, mm, is a force that can be used to create fake, for fake in, uh, information, disinformation, especially in images that, uh, that can be altered by artificial intelligence? Yeah, definitely. I mean, we don't, you know, th there's obviously a lot of 
a lot of talk about artificial intelligence at the moment, and we, we don't yet know the full impact of, of, you know, I mean, it can be, you know, it can change, you know, be a game changer in, in, for, in good ways as well, you know, um, not just for, but when it comes to, to journalism, I think it sounds so, I think we can, should we go to the example of? You've actually okay. taken us to our next section. Yeah. So brilliant, uh, Leon. Um, Ah, yeah. The scary thing about artificial intelligence, I had a bit of an experience with it a couple of months ago um, for the first time. So normally if I do an interview, I would, um, if I record an interview, I would transcribe it myself. And if it's Italian into English, translate it Italian into English myself. I find it useful to do that because it reminds me of what, you know, what was said during the interview and it makes the story a bit easier to write. But I was pushed for time a couple of months ago and everyone was talking about these transcriber sites and um, I did an interview, it was about an hour long, with a climate change um, scientist, and I transcribed it using a website called Happy Scribe, and it transcribed within minutes, and it was brilliant, it was a brilliant transcription. And this, you know, what was inc also incredible was that part of the recording, it was on the kitchen table, and we'd kind of moved to the other side of the room to, to, to talk about, you know, I think the scientist was showing me something on his YouTube, and that the recording managed to pick up the conversation from a couple of meters away, um, and it was it was trans, transcribed perfectly. And I thought, oh, brilliant! You know, this is really useful. You know, a job that would take me like you know, and it's always you know the worst <laughs> part of the job is transcribing. It's been done in a few minutes. Brilliant. And then it translated it translated it into Italian into English very quickly. And then there was this like um, thing on the site that said, oh, you, AI assist. And you could basically take the transcription and put it into a blog post or a summary or whatever. I thought, okay, let's just see what this looks like. And I did that, and it produced this very authoritative sounding um, summary of the, the climate change challenge in Italy. And it basically pulled what my climate guide set told me, but obviously AI works by basically canvassing like sources from everywhere. Um, so through content that is already owned by somebody else, you know? So that's, you know, again, one of the challenges for the media industry going forward. I mean, it's paid content basically being stolen and popped into this kind of thing. And I looked at that introduction, I thought, my God, that sounds really authoritative and good and probably something better than I write. Right? And, and I was like, oh God, I can't look at this anymore because it would have been tempting. You know, I was really tired as well. I'm on deadline early the next day <laughs> to have just copied and pasted it in. I didn't. <laughs> didn't. But, you know, that's, that's also the risk. It just sounded, it sounded really good. Does that so. sound familiar, guys? Uh, deadline, <laughs> essay to write, AI hey, could help. Yeah. Uh, I could just do it for you. Um, yeah, so... Um, I think you guys had a question. Yeah. Uh, did social media or AI affect the information that you published or the amount of workers uh, or anything really in that area? Does social media affect the amount of work? Yes. I do. Um, or the information that you publish? Yeah, I, social media for me, again, maybe because I'm... I'm <laughs> quite an older journalist. Uh, I kind of what, where it's useful is if, if you know I follow obviously Italy's prime minister online and the key politicians and the key personalities who I need to be following. And if they often they will make an announcement on social media first before it gets published. You know they're more used to doing communicating that way than they are holding a press conference. Um, so, so I would take, you know, so social media is definitely useful for that kind of information. Um, sometimes I'll be, I don't use Facebook as much, you know, I'm not on Facebook as much as I used to, but sometimes it, it's, it's very useful for contacts as well. You know, that's another, you know, positive aspect of social media. If I need, if there's somebody I need to speak to and I can't find a number for them anywhere, I often get and find them on social media and I'm able to message them and, and they respond and, and, you know, then you can speak to somebody. Um, sometimes it's useful when if somebody shared an article, especially if it's in the Italian press, because that's the country that I cover, that I think, oh, I haven't seen that story yet. 
people haven't seen, you know, great, I'll, I'll suggest that story to them, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll try and do that story too. So useful in, 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 in that respect. Um, but when it comes to just, you know, you are bombarded also with a lot of opinion. Um, no, I will only quote someone if they're in, obviously, a position of authority, authority and kind of needed for the story. Um, and was there another question? <laughs> oh, you're writing your question. Then you go. Very good process. Um, I think Rafi and Nils had a question. Maybe if you pass over and then. Uh, so, I mean, this is backtracking a tiny bit to before the AI questions, but you were talking about trustworthy sources and things like that, and it just sort of led me to think about um, do you think that there are, like, less trustworthy sort of big news outlets. As an example, I, I wouldn't trust Fox News, but I would trust The Guardian. Like, do you think that there are news outlets that are more profit-driven and so would be more likely to sort of, like, more profit-driven than actually publishing sort of reliable information and so would or could turn to publishing false information without fact-checking it, uh, yeah, comparing something like Fox oh, News or The Guardian? Definitely, I, I think it's important to, you know, but then, you know, obviously just as a normal reader, you know, you just want to, you know, something's happened in your, you know, again, the thing with journalism, obviously, obviously kind of these, we're talking about like global websites, but essentially a reader will more, more likely want, they want to know what's going on around them in their, in their town um, first, probably their country first before um, going kind of looking beyond um, the borders. And I think that the, you know, obviously, if you look at like local press, it's more likely to be. You actually, I think local press is probably more <laughs> can be more trusted purely because they have like you know, kind of smaller owners. Um, but yeah, just yeah, without veering veering off track, it's a very good question. Um, yeah, I think you you've got to again as an ordinary reader, you're probably just not thinking about who owns it. You don't realise who owns it. Um, but but there are a lot of. I think you've got to consider that that a lot of newspapers are owned by um, billionaires. Um, and they will have their their vested interests. And one prime example is is Rupert Murdoch, and that we've already seen um, incidents in, in Australian newspapers that he owns that are, that are now already using AI generated content instead of reporters. And readers aren't aware of that, you know. So um, so yeah, I think it's important to kind of look at the you know look at look for the, the trusted trusted source. How do you, as a journalist, decide what story you're going to write? Is it sort of, is there someone at The Guardian who assigns you a story that you then research and write on, or do you seek out stories yourself? And then where do those ideas for potential stories come from? Do they, do you see something on social media and think that's worth investigating and writing about, or how does, um, yeah, there's so much to decide. Yeah, there is. Way. There is. I mean, my, my role, uh, you know, my day-to-day -day duties are I, I have to get up and read all the Italian newspapers um, every day, and that can be, like, quite a laborious task sometimes. Um, and from that, like, especially at the moment, you know, when you have a big breaking... When, when the news is dominated by war, um, it's quite difficult for a correspondent in Italy to, to push my ideas you know so the last week or so my editors have wanted from me anything that's fun light joyful to balance out the horrific um situation there um but yeah i would have to read read the newspapers come up with i come up with my own ideas maybe send my editors two or three ideas very briefly you, know, you almost have to kind of craft a headline in, in your pitch to make sure they they read it because they're getting a lot of emails from lots of journalists all over the world and you know, there's only a certain number that will go into the newspaper or, or a website. Um, so, yeah, it, it's me. It's, um, you know, you've got to... The stories tend to come a lot through instinct. I think you kind of know what... You know, obviously, with the breaking news and you respond to breaking news, it's obviously... It, 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 that that um, happens. But other, other stories, you know, you've got to... Yeah, just, just kind of get a feel for what, what you think, you know, what you think the, the reader, always bearing in mind that, that I'm writing for an international audience um, and what might interest them about Italy, you know, and, and, and luckily Italy is quite, um, is a fascinating country to write about and any story about Italy does seem to get a lot of 
a lot of clicks, you know, especially, I would say clicks, reads, you know, people that read and <laughs> stuff right to the end. Um, you know, whether it's about art, culture, uh, politics, but occasionally an editor will see something like on the news wires and at Reuters and ask me to do, and ask us to, to write it, but we very much have to come up with our own. And it's a daily, daily thing, and it can be a bit of a grind when, when things are quiet. So we've got time for about, I think, just a couple more questions. So if we have Susanna, and then uh, if we pass, pass the microphone back, yeah. Um, so my question was more centered around your experience with the AI in uh, writing and transcribing your, um, your interview and your talk with, uh, about climate change. Is like the improving like, of AI threatening journalists and like is it pushing you to always seek innovation in your writing and uh, is it becoming better than actual real people like in journalism? That's our fear, you know, I mean, uh, you, we are anxious about that. Obviously we're anxious about the impact it will have on our jobs, but then we were also anxious about what would happen to, to journalism jobs when, when the internet came in. In, in the 90s, and, and I think it's actually grown. I think there have been more opportunities um, for journalists um, thanks to the internet. Um, I don't think, I think AI, you know, going forward, I mean, obviously, uh, my newspaper has, has um, they've, they've looked into the, this and how, how it can use AI tools in an efficient way. Um, but the, the overall message is, and the overall feeling is, it will never, you know, I'm not too worried about it replacing it because you all, the, the, the thing that builds trust with the reader is, is um, you know, obviously getting your facts right, you know, um, explaining, so, and to do that, you need to speak to people, and, and AI isn't going to replace that. It isn't going to replace going to a destination, and, and, and you know, which is why I'm always up for, you know, I always want to meet the person, you know, rather, even, even if it's easy to just do something over the phone, if, if, there's pro if proximity allows you to go and interview a person in person, I would prefer to do it that way because you get so much more out of it as well. Um, so I don't think I'm, I'm not so worried that AI will will replace that, you know. But um, but I'm coming at it from from a foreign correspondent and I travel a, quite a lot. You know, if there's a, if there's a big break, like I was in Venice a couple of weeks ago for for the horrific um, bus crash as well, um, and you know Lampedusa before that. Um, you, it, I don't think. AI will replace that. I think it can maybe be used, you know, to make things more efficient in certain ways, um, but not the human-to-human -human, um, contact that's needed to build trust. Thank you. Okay, I think we've got one more question from Isabella. Um, would you say that the issues that we've mentioned today impact your area of journalism maybe more than others, like fashion journalism or? I didn't, sorry, would you mind? Sorry. So, I didn't catch um, so, are these issues particularly relevant to your area of journalism as a foreign correspondent? Would they have an equal or greater impact on areas like fashion, music, um, uh, those sort of uh, culture sides, I suppose, of, of journalism? Oh, well, in terms of what I do? I well, I think in terms of the AI and, um, and the social media issues. Uh, okay, yeah. okay. Um, Yeah, that's quite a difficult. I think I think you know I think with AI I think it's quite too early to, to say how it will influence um, different different areas of journalism. I, I feel as a as foreign correspondent because we're kind of we're we're here, you know the, the the advantage for us is being here on the ground. Um, I don't think it will, but I think certain other, other sectors of journalism, it might be easier to just go with AI than it would be um, to, to, but I, yeah, I think a good organization probably wouldn't, you know, hopefully wouldn't allow it to, to get to that stage. Okay, fantastic. I think I had one final question. I'm so sorry. I think this might have to be the last one. So I apologize. No, I wanted to ask uh, a similar question before. I wanted to ask if a journalist are afraid that um, in the future AI might like um, take away their jobs by doing it for them. So. Okay, well we have yeah. that one, yeah. this red one, so that was great minds think alike, which means we do have time for one final question. Um, quick. 
Um, so when you're writing an article, like, what would the sources be? Like, and how do you know which ones are trusted? Do you like have a person at the area where the things happen, events happening, or do you get it online from like other news things? Yeah, I think again, I th yeah, sources take you know you can take years to build trusted sources, and and that comes with being in the place. You know, obviously when I arrived in Italy, I didn't didn't know anyone. Um, but then over time, it's been it's been ten years now. You you get to know you get to know people. So I, I I have you know people that I can call upon depending you know if it's a political story I can know who to call. If it's if, um, if it's an immigration story you know you know you know who to call. Especially if you need to be quick um, to write the story from you know from your desk um, before um, travelling anywhere. Um, the travelling brings the contacts. It brings the sources. Because um, often now, again, the thing is with the journalistic cycle, you find yourself, especially when you've been doing it for, for so long, you know, the similar stories keep repeating themselves, um, especially in Italy. Another government collapse, another government collapse. Right? Yeah, so you know exactly who to go to, <laughs> like your political um, experts. So, yeah, um, if, it's, if it's a totally new field, though, totally new story, what, what I'd often do is obviously I'll, I'll go online and I'll see who's quoted in those stories, who's given the information, um, it could be a police source or something else, and then, then you then try and get on the phone and, and make contact yourself. Thank you so much, uh, okay. no, Mr. Thank Frida. You. And um, I think that's a lovely way to end, actually, this, this picture, if, in a way, of what I always thought was the glamorous life of the, of the journey, you know, traveling, meeting people, building those contacts over a lifetime, over a career. I think that's absolutely yeah. fascinating. And you're right, I don't see how AI could replace that. Um, so um, in terms of a possible career for you guys to be thinking about, perhaps actually one that is going to be around for a while. Um, maybe the, the, the robot won't take this one from, you, from us. Um, guys, could I ask you to uh, join me in thanking Mr. Freda for coming and talking to us today?